1 Samuel 13, please. 1 Samuel chapter 13. I find a lot of rich gleanings in the life of Saul, which I don't know why. But there's a lot of rich gleanings here to be learned from. And his character is perhaps the longest that I've ever preached. I preached an entire chapter, 1 Samuel 15, on that one. It only took two hours long in the end of the sermon, so it was that short. Uh, this one, I intend to go much shorter, hopefully. <laughs> uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, the story is familiar to some of you, where King Saul, he just finished reigning for a couple of years, had a great victory against his enemies, and now he is continuing the battle against the Philistines. As he approaches that day of battle, we see the first instance of where he failed. First, dis, uh, first instance of his disobedience against God. Because of this, the prophet Samuel told him that the Lord will no longer establish his kingdom forever. And it was at this point in his battle against the Philistines, he was against such big odds. He was scared. So you couldn't really blame him for him resorting to his own way to gain victory rather than following God's ways. After all, when we read his life, we can empathize so much with Saul and match a lot with him. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, the Bible points out the classic passage where he messed up at verse 8. Verse 8. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord, and I forced myself therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom forever. Saul, we cannot really blame him, as you notice from this passage, <clears throat> that he had a set appointed time to meet with Samuel, so he knows according to the law of Moses, he is not supposed to offer a burnt offering without the prophet Samuel. But the prophet Samuel did not come at the day appointed, the Bible said. He didn't. What can Saul do? He had no choice, you can empathize. And he resorted to his own way of doing things because he said, you'll notice one of those verses pointed out now. Now the problem is coming. Now I need an answer from God. Now I need to do something. Not later. You already set up the appointed time, Samuel, and you delayed. You missed it out. And because of that, I had no choice because my flesh can't take it anymore. Because the people around me are leaving and I'm losing the support due to their fear of the Philistines. The Philistines outnumber us. It is absolutely impossible that with me in my current condition that I will be able to gain victory against the Philistines without God intervening. So why is it that God is not intervening at this time and he is too late? Sounds like you. But guess what? Samuel did show up. But Saul said, you set up an appointed time and you didn't come. It's too late. They're going to come right now. Right now, Saul, as soon as you were building up your own burnt offering, Samuel showed up, so you still had time. Problem is, Saul, is 
you don't know the time better than God does. In your mind, you think it's too late. It's past the due date. But even if it's past the due date and Lazarus is already, day, uh, already dead, Lazarus is already dead and Jesus comes four days later, he still resurrected him from the dead. And that is Saul's exact problem that we struggle with is that we're right now facing that collision that pressure, that stress, and that turmoil, but we fail to realize that, hey, in the end, we're still going to come out all right. We don't realize how capable we are of still living, breathing, enjoying life, still having good things, and God turning the impossible situations, things that were already too late, into things that went beyond our expectations, into things that turned out to be better than what we could have imagined. When we face this pressure and conflict, we know all this stuff about God intervening on our behalf and raising the dead back to life, even though we think it's long dead and gone. But at that moment of pressure, we still can't help but go by our fleshly instinct to mess up. Let's examine those parts very carefully and see why in the moment of pressure, it's like instinct where we mess up and look at those things more carefully. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray that you'll fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood. Help me to speak the words properly and rightly. I am not a good preacher, but you've turned me into something that can give something at least that will help them. So will you please do so again? To you be the glory, Father, in whatever comes out in this message. So take control in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now when we look at verses 1 through 4, <clears throat> the Bible points out, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel. We are of 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah. Of Benjamin and the rest of the people, he sent every man to his tent. So here is Saul, he's just minding his own business, doing his own thing as usual, and when he comes in that midst of the conflict with the Philistines, believe it or not, Jonathan was the one who took action, not Saul. Because in verse 3, and Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines. That was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines. And that Israel also was had in abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. Jonathan was the one who smote that garrison of the Philistines, who started the ruckus. And the Philistines, they got so mad that they thought it was Saul who did all of that. But no, Saul was just minding his own business, doing his normal thing, and then his boy Jonathan just comes up and then takes action. Now the Philistines are even more angry, and they assemble a huge army, and Saul is in trouble. From this passage, then, we see right here, Saul's problem was not that he was impatient and he couldn't wait on the Lord. Wait a minute, but didn't we find out later on that that was his exact problem, that he was impatient, he couldn't wait on God, and so that's why he had to build up a burnt offering and make sure that that is taken care of on the spot because he couldn't wait on the Lord anymore? Wasn't that his problem? Well, if you go back in that text, Saul was actually delaying. And Jonathan was the one that took action. As a matter of fact, even after Saul built the burnt offering and then Samuel intervened by praying and now Saul got God on his side, he finally got the answer to prayer, we find out that he was still doing his own business. He was still delaying because Jonathan went up ahead when all that happened in the next chapter, only taking him and his armor bearer, and they slaughtered a good number of the Philistines with just him and the armor bearer, while Saul was doing what? Minding his own business, not taking action. 
You know what? You think that your problem is, I need to take action right now. I need to solve the problem. So let me jump ahead of God and then do my own thing. But in reality, you don't really take action. You actually delay, believe it or not. You actually delay. A lot of things in life that we go through, you'd be surprised that everybody and a lot of Bible believers like you are going through the same hardships and you're not the unique one that is moaning and groaning and has the whole world up against you and you're at that point where I don't know what to do. God help me. Uh, I need an answer and you don't get it. You're not the only one. You're not the only one. There are plenty of other people out there and what the lost world does, the lost world, not just say believers, but what the lost world and what everybody does is when there's a problem, they take action on it. Instead of just sitting, groaning, moaning, and say, feeling like they're trapped and there's nothing that can be done about it. They know exactly what to do. And they act upon it. You Christians know what exactly to do. You know exactly what to do. Well, I can't build up the burnt offering. i got to wait by God's appointed time. Why are you only looking at that, Saul? Why aren't you going back to your prayer closet and praying to the Lord, you and him? You could have done that. Why couldn't you just meditate on the scriptures, Saul, and keep up with your devotional and keep up with your Bible reading and get some comfort from the Lord and get established? Saul, why don't you just come to church? Why don't you just go out soul winning? Why don't you just praise the Lord? Hey, Saul, why don't you just memorize some scriptures and then quote it? Saul, why don't you just take a break? Saul, why don't, don't you have your own plans in life on how you can make your life better? After all, the world does, right? world has their plans. If you, got a, if you got an injury in your hand or if you get an injury in your eye or an injury seriously on your body, you're not going to wait for Samuel to come and build your own burnt offering like that. No, you and I are going to call 911. You're, you and I are going to call the hospital. You and I are going to know what to do and take care of it. Now, the problem is, a lot of problems that you go through in life, you'd be surprised the lost world already do those things, except you, because you think that you're in a trapped situation and there's nothing that can be done about it. But Jonathan doesn't think so. Jonathan knows, hey, let's just go out there and whip their tails. Just get a sword and then cut their heads off. You know what to do. You got your Bible, you got prayer, you got God, you got church, you got pastor, you got brothers and sisters in Christ, and you got plenty of worldly resources, so you're not in really a trapped scenario where everything is helpless and hopeless and you're going to die. I think people for thousands of years who didn't have insurance, people for thousands of years who didn't have medicine, People for thousands of years who didn't have the resources like you and I have, and even in third world countries right now, third world countries right now where they don't have easy access like you and I do, if they can survive all that time without those things, you and I will be just fine. Now, you got plenty of stuff. You just need to act upon it unless you just want to be like Saul and sit down, whine, and cry. Now, just act upon it. We see that in Jonathan's case that he went out to the battle, that he took action, and he didn't blame the devil. He didn't say, oh, Satan sent this thing because he knows I'm living right for God. No, he didn't think like that. He just thought Philistines are there. This happens in war. Everybody faces an enemy. Everyone faces a massive number of armies. Solution. Pick up a sword and let's go fight. He didn't blame God. Oh, God, why did this happen to me? Oh, Lord, uh, why, why is everything so bad? No, Jonathan wasn't like Saul 
saying, all of you are against me, and siding with David, and well, why don't you make yourself better than Saul? You know, he's used to playing a victim, like many people in this day and age. This is America for crying out loud, and people use the minority card and the disadvantaged card or whatever victimization, and Christians do the same thing, and they feel like there's nothing I can do about it, and they complain and whine about it rather than doing something about it. That's the problem with us nowadays. It's so, uh, we always blame about our financial problems, we always blame how, how wicked this place is, so then it's so hard to serve God. We always blame about, you know, our traumatic experiences and what we went through. And we spend so much time whining and crying and feeling trapped about those situations rather than realizing that there are plenty of people out there who go through the same thing like you and I do and they don't just sit, whine and cry and die. They pick up a sword and take action. If you don't like your problem, you do something about it. Where are you waiting for? Huh? You think that you need Samuel to come with the burnt offering. No, that's for that scenario. There are plenty of ways you can do things instantaneously for the Lord. You don't need, listen, you don't need a Samuel with the burnt offering as your only answer to that problem in life, that's God's working out, that's God's timetable, let him work that out. Use other utilities that the Lord has given to you, other things that the world is even doing to take care of other situations and problems you're going through. You know what you want? You want this one specific problem to be solved like that. That's your problem. You want a Samuel and you want a burnt offering. No, you don't need that. You need the Bible. You need peace. You need clarity from the Lord. You need encouragement. You need preaching. You need things that will keep you going. You need a good time. You need a break. You don't need, I need this problem gone with a burnt offering. You're so preoccupied on that. You're so preoccupied on that. Look at verses 5 through 7. So the first point is the act of survival. Now let's talk about the angst of survival. The angst of survival. Notice in verse 5 through 7, oh my goodness, you talk about anxiety here, angst. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand, which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from Beth Haven when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait I like that. Saw that they were in a strait. Saw that they were in a strait. Whoa, man. That feels like a lot of tension there. That feels like that they're trapped, that there's no other way around it. There's no opening. There's no moment to break here. They're in a strait. For the people were distressed. And the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Man, you talk about angst. Why? Because all their support options that they tried out, that Saul tried out, all gone. All gone. I tried it before, Pastor. I talked to brothers and sisters in Christ. I even came to you for counseling. I went to other things where uh, I could get the support system and then it doesn't work and it's all gone. Here comes those Philistines. They're a huge number. And when they come for you, they're not going to show you mercy. You know they're going to tear you apart you know it's gonna hurt and you know that you need help but you don't get the help why because it's a huge number it's not a little problem do you understand it's not a little problem do you understand the problem that I'm going through here is that this is a huge number it's not like hey be strong the Lord get over with it no it's a major problem 
And I can't take it because it's a huge number. It's a huge army. You wouldn't understand because you didn't go through what I'm going through here. Because when I'm seeing it, I'm experiencing, I went through that in my past and right now, and you're not. So it's easy for you to preach the word of the Lord to me, to tell me what's the right thing to do, but you never went through it yourself. I mean, people are hiding in the caves, in the bushes, because they think that this trial is so hot for them. It's that dangerous. Do you understand that? So if I hide, if I run away to a cave, if I slip up in temptation here and there to run away from the problem, if I don't come back to church and miss out here and there because of that Philistine problem, if I go to that dark, lonely, isolated cave and you can't help but be depressed and miserable there, Everybody's doing that too, Pastor. So you talk about angst and I cannot help it. Use your common sense here. Let's use common sense right here. It's easy to say that God will work it out, that God answers prayer and you serve a great and mighty God. But when we're thinking by just common sense and by reason, these are just normal things and these are problems that would normally cause such angst that anybody would run away. Anybody would sin. Anybody wouldn't have the strength to apply the spiritual principles because they're just too tired, too exhausted. Talk about angst. Why? Because all of this is based on how I experience what I'm feeling, what I'm seeing how my mind is running 100 miles per hour, and I try, I really, really try to trust God, to wait on the Lord, to apply the principles, but I can't help it but lose sleep at night because reason and my brain is just going... <laughs> angst. Angst. Because the verse said, they saw that they were in a strait. They saw that they were in a strait. Again, I'm experiencing all of that. My head is coming up with strong reasons about why that problem is serious. Why I got to resort to my own way. Why I can't go by the right way that the Lord would want me to do. Why I have a good legitimate reason to fear and to worry. Too many people are pressuring me. The problem is just too great. I can't take it anymore. That's being in a strait, it sounds like, doesn't it? Didn't the previous descriptions sound like you saw you're in a strait? You saw you're in a strait. But see, um, that's where when the fiery darts of the enemy keep hitting you, that the Bible says you need your shield of faith. And faith always goes in conflict with reason and experience. All the time, those, those things never match up together. So reason and experience, they will always contradict your faith. Which is the reason why you need the shield of faith to approach those fiery darts. Because your reason and experience will betray you. And it will always expose you to the fiery darts. And you will always get hurt and you will die. Every time. Every time your reason and your experience, no matter how good your reason is, no matter how good your experience is, as it's been described earlier, saw that they were in a strait and you felt like that with what I described to you. Doesn't matter how good that is, they will always contradict your faith. So that means if you put up your shield of faith, then it should go in conflict against your reason and experience. It should get victory against that if you abide by it. It's the right thing to resort to besides reason and experience. Why? Because the reason why is experience is based on seeing, right? They saw that they were in a strait. 
It's based on feeling. They saw that they were in a strait. And that is so visually, imaginatively real, scary to you. But when you put your shield of faith, you can't see it. You know what the shield's job is? You don't see it. And it keeps deflecting off the fiery darts of the wicked. But I'll tell you one thing. If you do want to keep feeling it, if you do want to keep seeing it, put your shield of faith down. Go ahead. And just one time is enough where that arrow is going to hit you right between the eyeballs and then your sight won't be the same again after that. And you will always experience fear, trauma, and yeah, it will be permanent. But see, that faith, that shield of faith will prevent you from feeling it, feeling the flame, seeing the flame. Faith always blinds you, see that? Faith always blinds you from what you're feeling. Faith always contradicts what you're feeling. Faith always does that. If by believing in the promises of God and the power of His Word and the omnipotence of our Almighty God, it blinds you from seeing and feeling the pain and just believing that no matter how much I feel, no matter how much I vividly see it, God's word is still true and he's going to turn it into something good. That's the blindness of faith. The, you know how faith blinds you against reason? Because all the time, as you're seeing those fiery darts, you know what reason does all the time? It examines those fiery darts. It takes an even more careful look at the fiery dart. And it'll take its time to look at the greatness and the strength and the horror and the fear and the ugliness and the reality of that fiery dart. That's what reason will do every time you look at it. It's so convincing. And that fiery dart is enough to convince you with some Christians that they're not careful to even doubt their salvation and even become atheists. Because you know why? They're, all they're looking is that fiery dart, the strength and the magnificence and the ugliness and the horror of that fiery dart rather than looking at our great God, our great Savior. And Romans 8, 28, and his 200 promises. And that no matter what I feel or see, God's word is still true. They don't look at the strength and the magnitude of how he fed the 5,000. How he split that Red Sea in half. How God used a little stone to take down a giant. How just marching around a formidable wall seven times would crumble down with just a mere shout. How they couldn't see all that. Why? Because all they saw was the fires of hell itself. And that devil cackling, laughing at them. And their life being so unfair. And that how this reason there, and that reason there, and that reason there, based on these reasons, how can I keep serving God? They spend all their time contemplating and thinking and seeing those things rather than seeing the greatness of our God who spoke the worlds into existence. Amen. That's what shield of faith does. See, the shield of faith blinds you from seeing the strength, the magnitude of your trial. What faith does, all the time you're saying, man, I can't wait to see how God's going to turn that impossible thing to something possible. Man, all I see is how God did miracles in my life. Man, all I see is memories of my tears and pain and how God turned it to joy and how I preferred those things in the end. How I see in this shield of faith is every time I was proven wrong and God was proven right. That's all you're seeing. That's all you're seeing. But if you see yourself in a strait, I wonder what you're seeing. That's what the shield of faith does. Put it down once, that's enough. That's enough to make the fiery dart legitimate to you. Verses 8 through 12, the third point is the abruptness of survival. The abruptness of survival. Notice that the Bible says, and he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. 
But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw. See that? I saw. I was in a stray. I saw that. That the people were scattered from me. Good reason. Not a bad one. Legitimate good reason. That fiery dart is actually fiery. It's not a walk in the park. It's not something you can say, be a soldier of Jesus Christ, get over it. Stop crying about it. No, that fiery dart is real. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's real. It's legitimate because that's all you're seeing. And that thou camest not within the days appointed. Good argument. So how can God top that one? That's a good argument. So how can God's promise, God's word be true? Good argument. I don't have any argument against that. So reasonable. Because that's all you're paying attention to. That's all you're focusing on. That's all you're seeing. Samuel, you didn't show up at the day appointed. Good reason. You know what I would do if I was Samuel? If I was a pastor? I understand. I get you. I'm so sorry. I should have came earlier. You know what God would say? No, you're wrong. I'm still right. The last part of verse 11, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. And that's a lot of problems. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. That's why he was very abrupt. He couldn't wait on the Lord. He needs to survive. He has to take matters into his own hands. Now, there is one simple le lesson you can see out of this in spite of the complexity of the problem. When you look at the problem, problem always becomes complex. It's not that simple to solve. But if you look at the solution, not the problem, the solution is always simple. The solution is always easy. And if you spend your time, all your time just looking at that, you'd save yourself a lot of complex tension and complex stress. So if you just look at the solution, you and I know, and I don't need to tell you, wait on the Lord and trust in him and just stay in the boat, disciple, while the storm is crashing all around you. And why not sleep next to Jesus Christ while the storm is going onward and just trust yourself into the hands of God and let the stored storms of life rage on. Let it crash louder, let the wave and the water flow and get higher, but you just leave yourselves in the hands of God and wait on his very own good timing. Yes. That's all you got to do. Solution, simple. But we cannot wait. You know why we cannot wait? Every time I see that water coming into my ship and I'm the disciple, the tendency is, and the body, it's just instinctly made to do this, when water comes into the ship, I don't go like this. Praise the Lord. No, you know what I do? Why? I want that problem gone. It's that simple. I want the problem gone. I don't want to think about it anymore. I don't want to go through sleepless nights about it anymore. I'm sick and tired of my brain racking about it and my heart, heart pumping in, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, making me scared about it. You know what the fleshly instinct is? <gasps> we prefer that. We prefer the problem gone. But every time you do that, more water comes in. And then you just keep doing it again. And guess what? You're not going to finish it in five minutes. You're going to take hours and hours and hours. And you and me can agree, brother, we both know it. Every one of you knows that. Yes, sir. Why? You want the problem gone, but guess what? You and I know this. Problem still ain't gone. Right. 
problem's still there. So you might as well just ride through the problem and let Jesus Christ worry it for you. Let Jesus Christ solve it for you. Let Jesus Christ take the water out for you and just let God do it. Easier said than done because our flesh is just unconsciously, instinctively built to pick up a pail and get the water out. We don't have time to pray. We don't have time to reflect. We don't have time to think about it. Uh, uh, everything you heard in the preaching just now, guess what? You're going to forget it within that 0.5 second time when the enemy throws in that fiery dart and the instinct is, run away! How are you going to think about my preaching after that within 0.5 seconds? You know what the fleshly instinct is? Not waiting on the Lord, but taking care of the problem yourself. Instinct! That's why Saul said, I can't help it. I forced myself. It's like some unnatural force that came into me and I can't help it. So I forced myself. And I think the greatest lesson that can be learned to your flesh so that it is unconsciously built to a point where it will become instinct, is I truly prefer to let God handle the problem. I truly prefer not daring to do my own thing first before God does it. I truly believe that God is powerful to handle the problem. And you really believe in that, and then you convince yourself of that, and your flesh is will be conditioned and built upon that instinct, and perhaps the reflex... When the devil throws a dart at you is not to pick up a pail and throw the water out again. Verse 13 through 14. 13 through 14. See, you got to convince your flesh. I just want peace with God. I just want God to handle the problem for me. I just want to trust and obey for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus. See, you just got to surrender to that. But see, the flesh doesn't want to surrender, does it? The flesh, all it wants is, I want the problem gone. I think what your flesh needs to learn is, let the problems come. Let the problems rage on. Let the problems be disintegrated, annihilated, and conquered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, 13 through 14, the Bible says, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Oh, I understand, Saul. That's a very good reason. No, you are foolish. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God. It's, it's based on that reason. What better reason, what gooder reason can top than just obeying the Lord? No matter how good your reason is, no matter how strong your experience is, nothing in life, nothing in creation, how it functions and built, will go against the word of the Lord. Amen. Going against the word of the Lord is far more far more a greater thing to prioritize and worry is disobeying the word of the Lord. The verse says, which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Did you see that right there? It's as if Samuel was indicating that now God would have established your kingdom forever. In other words, if Saul only obeyed what God told him, just that, just only obeyed what God told him, perhaps the tide would have changed and God would have established Saul's kingdom forever. Why? Very simple. He didn't go, he didn't obey, he didn't follow 
God's way of doing things. See, when you always step out of it, you always step out of what blessing, the best thing God intended for you. All the time. And Samuel keeps telling you, if only you just follow that, then that ultimate benefit and blessing that God planned out for you would have happened. And now you lost it forever. And God has to do something else different with you. If, uh, if someone laid out certain instructions for you to follow, and he told you this, all right, in order to make this delicious cake, what you have to do is this much amount of, I don't know. I, know, I don't know a thing about baking a cake. Okay, shh, I'm the pastor, all right, so let me, let me make up stuff, all right? Let me make up stuff, okay? Put a third cup of sugar. Put a, a 0.5 pound measurement, I don't know, of flour. And shh, I'm the pastor, shh. Make sure you bake it for 60 minutes. Man, that sounds like a good cake, don't, don't it, brother? Yeah. And make sure you put 20 layers of cream all over it. <laughs> and by doing that, every sim simple, specific detail, amount of instruction, you know if you went by the precise minute, the precise timing, the precise amount of the right ingredient that he instructed you specifically to put, then you're going to get the cake that you want and then the people are going to say, man, that was a really good cake. And you go, yeah, because I watched YouTube. YouTube told me the specific details and ingredients, the instructions. And because I believed it, and I followed it, and I didn't let anything else make me worry. I just only paid attention. It was so simple. The solution was so simple. Yes, it was a, yes, I had to humble myself and stop critiquing the video and say, well, you know, I could do something better. You know, let me try out this way. No, by doing that, you ruin the whole plan to have the best cake to eat. Right. You just ruin everything by one detail. There's a big difference with one third of the amount you're putting with one half. Huge difference, even though it looks very small to you even though you're just deviating from the instruction just a little bit in an understandable way. But when you, when you look at a straight line and then you only go like 0 .001, I don't care how small it is, 0 .001 away from a straight line, then another 0 .001 and another 0 .001, that's enough to not make it a straight line. That's enough. Brother, sister in Christ, when God wants you to eat the best cake that there is and for it to be a blessing to you and to other people, God tells you one thing. Read your Bible. Get to church. Stop skipping. You know, believe that verse. You know, stay away from sin and but see, when you go like this, just this, see, just a little bit, see, because I had an understandable scenario. I'm going through something and, oh, you don't, uh, yeah, then you know this. Then it goes a little bit, just a little bit like this, just a little bit. Now, you notice right here that just by little bit, you're already making a U-turn away from the best plan that God prepared for you. Right. And guess what? You know what you go to? You don't go to the blessing. You always go back to the same problem. Mm -hmm. Just enough, just a little bit. Right. Obey the Lord. Lesson learned. Just obey the Lord. Because just a little bit makes a huge difference. It turns it into a U-turn. It turns into returning to the same problem you had before. So that was my fourth point is the authority of survival.
the authority. You got to follow the right authority. And the fifth point is the abode of survival. The abode of survival. If you look at verses 15 through 18, the Bible says, And Samuel arose and gat him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men. And Saul and Jonathan his son, and the people that were present with him, abode in Gibeah Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped at Michmash. And the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned unto the way that leadeth to Ophrah, unto the land of Shual. <clears throat> and another company turned the way to Beth Horon. And another company turned to the way of the border that looketh to the valley of Zeboin toward the wilderness. You know what happened? There are all these spoilers of Philistines. And when it says spoil, you know what that means? They're going to spoil you. Take everything that you got. And by the way, these are three large companies too, not just one. Three large companies too. And guess what? They're coming for you and they're not slowing down. And when these problems come for you and you know at any moment you're going to get spoiled and you know it, you know it. They're going to spoil you three times over and there's nothing that could stop it, nothing that could delay it. What can you do? Well, Saul, all he could do was, the Bible says he abode in Gibeah. That's all he could do. What's he going to do, run away? <clears throat> I'm sure that'll do a good job. Philistines will still keep chasing after him. Even, even if he ran away from that problem, another enemy will come for him. Won't do any good. What can he do? Cry, whine, while, he's, while those Philistines are coming? <laughs> Not much good that will do. What can he do? Have a self-pity party and then start playing the victim card and saying, oh, help me, someone help me, when no one's going to come to help him or save the day? What can he do? Sin, mess up, you know, go out, smoke, drink, dance, do something fleshly. What can he do? He got, there's no place to run. There's no, nothing else to do except just abide. Just abide because they're coming anyway. You know what thing I learned? Use flash, huge enlightenment, okay? You're going to go, wow, I never thought of it before, all right? When you're going through that huge problem in your life, and when you think about all the world's problems, which is so awful, you know, famine, disease, hunger, stress, overwork, family tensions, kids talking bad about you, church members talking bad about you, and, you know, uh, you're trying to make ends meet, and you don't know where you're going to find money, and newsflash, huge enlightenment, you're not getting out of it until the rapture. You're stuck in it. You live in it. Yeah. Wow, I never knew that before. Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Just sit down and cry then? Might as well, huh? Might as well just sit down and be miserable. That's what Saul did. Saul said, I don't want any of you to eat anything until I be avenged of my enemies. Wow, Saul, why would you say something like that? We're going to starve and we're going to die. I know it's bad, but to tell us we can't eat anymore? Come on, man. And here is Jonathan, and he's getting the job done, and he has faith in God with his armor bearer. And as he slaughters them, he knows he's got three companies still coming, but he sees really good honey over there. And he's like, look, that honey is good simple. I'm going to take my staff, take a dip of that honey, and just eat it. Oh! And as the next chapter reads, Jonathan said, how my eyes were enlightened. Enlightened. On, wow, that was such a good revival meeting. Man, that was good Sunday service. I really needed that. Wow, God really helped me out with this problem when I prayed and read his word. Man, my heart sure feels better after the preaching. Man, I, 
I'm surprised at the grace that God has given to me, how it's able to overcome. I can't believe all that time in my house, in my family, even in this physical world without the spiritual blessings, how many good things I overlook that I can still enjoy. Wow, my eyes are enlightened on how great life can be. Oh, this honey is so good. Here, try it out. Try it out. Try it out, the preacher says. Here, take a bite, the preacher says. But then, even if you take a bite, oh, no, I'm not going to eat. Oh, I'm just too miserable. Oh, yeah, that honey ain't that good. Uh, man, do you see those three Philistine armies coming again? We're all going to die. It's really eating me up. Don't you get it, man? No, I don't get it. Because all I am is just eating honey. That's all I'm paying attention to. Why? Because there are two differences here. But one similarity. One difference, the guy is making the best out of it, just eating the honey. The other person is starve yourself from the honey. Skip church, skip the blessing of God, skip even physical blessings in life, skip the joy of salvation. Let's not think about that. Let's not talk about that. Let's not ponder on that. Skip all those things. I just want to starve and be miserable. So those are the two differences. But they have one similarity. They're both abiding in Gibeah, and those armies and problems are coming for both of them. Now, you might as well, you might as well, when they're coming for you, and you've got nothing to do, and you don't know what to do, and you're trapped, and all you're doing is stuck in a problem, abiding in Gibeah, you might as well grab as much honey as you can and make the best out of it. And try to focus on that. And try to not see faults and problems with that. Mm -hmm. And try not to say, well, that's good enough. I want something else. Look, when you're stuck in a problem, rather than starving yourself, you might as well just drown yourself silly. Yeah. And then let your eyes, let God open your eyes just a bit. And guess what? Newsflash, those Philistines ain't going to take your spoils at the end. The problem is not going to win against you at the end. Newsflash. You're still going to have the spoils. And you're going to even spoil those spoilers that are coming for you. Those problems that are coming for you, you're going to spoil those problems. You know that? Because that's God's job is to make all things, including those problems, turn out for your advantage and betterment. So you're going to spoil those spoilers. So in the meantime, while that's coming to you, you can either stay miserable and be miserable until you get the spoil or just keep trying to enjoy the honey and enjoy it here and there until you get the spoil. Which one would you prefer? Now the last point is the amount of survival. The amount of survival, let's look at verses 19 through 23. 19 through 23. The Bible says, now, there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. That is a very negative con connotation. So the Bible is pointing out uh, what happens uh, when you lose the NRA, when you lose the, uh, all the right to bear arms. Uh, it's a negative connotation. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them sword or spears. Let me tell you the original Hebrew translation for that. For the liberals and Democrats said, lest those intolerant, dangerous fundamentalists get some we weapons and there's some mass shootings that I see in the news. Verse 20, but all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan, his son was there found. 
And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. That verse points you out the negativity, not the positivity, of no weapons. No weapons. And those Philistines are coming, and they're going to win. And what did they have? No weapons. Where are my guns when I need them? They're not there. All I got is what? A little toothpick. A little app to call the police. And they'll be there five hours later. They're just going to be right there in the nick of time through Los Angeles traffic, through that San Francisco bridge there. They're going to be just right there. All they got was a fork, man. All they had was a little axe. Something good that will do. Every day I walk in this liberal area, I put my hands in my keys because those are the only things I could rely on if someone comes for me. To take out little three little keys and think that I'm Wolverine and just go, and then tell my wife, run, you know. Just run! That's what I do. That's, that's, all, that's all I could do, you know. All I got is a fork, a matic, coulter, and an axe. A lot of good that would do with three huge armies of Philistines that are coming for you. And there's nothing positive about it. It's all negative. They're not sufficient to help you. And guess what? God, the Holy Spirit, knows that when he wrote that. He knows those things that they have are not sufficient to pull them through the day, to help them out with their problem. What you got? All you got is a fork. That ain't going to pull you through. You know what's going to pull you through? You know what's going to get you out of the problem? It's called the second coming of Jesus Christ. And if he came down and brought in the Garden of Eden, problem solved. But there are so many hundreds of verses with God recognizing that when sin and pain and trials happen in your life, it's not easy. It's not positive, it's negative. And God understands that. And God knows it. And all you got is a fork and a mattock. And you're like, God, how, how can I live with this? And God says, I know. I wish I could give you something better. Just solve the problem like that. But that's not reality. Right. Reality, we live in a sin-filled, cursed world, and these things happen. So what I can do is take those insufficient little things and turn it into sufficiency. Mm -hmm. Turn it into victory. Turn it into power. Turn it into something that will bring greater glory to me and something that will be beneficial for you. I understand the trial is not positive. It's negative. It's painful. It's sad. It's miserable. God's not jumping up and down and saying, I want you to go through problems so I can give you something beautiful. That's not it. God had it his way. He'd give you the garden of Eden, give you perfection. But guess what? That's not how reality works because of our stinking sin problem. So we inevitably live through that. Even people who we don't intend to give our sinful consequences to, we affect them. That's how wicked, that's how bad, that's how negative sin is. That leaves you all with just a stinking little fork. But God says, I can take that insufficient fork Amen. and turn it into just enough. Just enough. And I know it's just a book. And 99 cent. And it's not like when you read that book, all of a sudden your painful feeling of cancer is gone. God would prefer that. God would like your painful feeling of cancer to be gone. But that's not how it works. And I know you're taking that little fork and that Bible when you're reading it, when you're going through cancer and family problems and financial issues and health issues, and even sinful, spiritual, hopeless, dire situations that you're going through that I don't know about, and I can't name it in this preaching. And when it, everything is just insufficient, feels weak, you're about to throw in the towel, and God knows it, and God doesn't want that for you, and all you got is a little fork that costs 99 cents, and it's called the King James Bible. But guess what? It's enough. 
God will make it enough. And that's why he told you to memorize it. That's why he told you to read it. That's why he told you to have faith in it. That's why he told you to study it. That's why he told you to hold it, hold on to it with everything you've got because you got nothing else left. You got nothing that will help you except that little fork. What are you going to do? Cry, whine, and die about, I don't have a gun to defend myself when you're never going to get that gun? You might as well take that fork, child of God, and that verse said they had a file. I don't know what that means, but I think I'm going to just take it simply. Perhaps it meant just taking a file, getting that fork, and going, some good that thing will do, huh? <laughs> what, three huge armies of Philistines? I need a gun! I need a nuke for crying out loud! What are you going to do? Cry and whine and complain about something you're never going to get? That's what this culture is doing, this generation is doing, right? Give me more privilege, give me more this and that. You're never going to even get it. And the stuff that you get from the government don't even cure your Philistine problem. You might as well grab that fork. And it's called Bible Baptist Church. I know we're not much. Yeah, praise the Lord, amen. You hurt my feelings. I know your pastor ain't much. Don't say amen to that one. Your pastor ain't much. Your brother and sister in Christ ain't much. The numbers here aren't that much. And our ministry ain't much. And it would be better if we probably had a Bible-believing church somewhere in Idaho or Texas or in Florida or somewhere far from California. But this is all we've got here in this wicked liberal area, in this trapped, economic, stupid, foolish, unfair life. And if this is all I got, then I'm going to have to just make my church even better. I'm going to spend more time on this. Because I'm going to use this thing to stab every Philistine problem the best way that I can. And if all I got is three songbooks, and I know they don't mean much. There are only 2,000 songs. You wish you had an unlimited supply like the world does with their beats and their guitar and all that. But you can take those three hymn books and you can go, all your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there, never a burden he cannot bear. Oh, that's a little better. Oh, but the problem's so big, and uh, at least it's a little better. Never a friend like Jesus. Yeah. 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 And you stab the problem. And guess what? You got... You got one fork, which is Bible Baptist Church. Second fork, hymn singing. Third fork, your King James Bible. Fourth fork, prayer. Fifth fork, your brother and sister in Christ. Sixth fork, spiritual promise number one. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Spiritual problem, a spiritual uh, promise number seven. Romans 8, 28. Spirit, spiritual promise. Fork number eight. There hath no temptation taken you. I like that one. He won't give you a burden greater than you can bear. Eight, nine, ten, because you got 200 promises of God left. And then, as you're singing Count Your Many Blessings, you look at the physical things that you've got too, and you realize that, wow, I got, a, I got enough. I got enough. Even if my flesh thinks it's not enough, it's insufficient. It's not a gun. It's not a spear. It's not a sword. It's a fork against three huge armies of Philistines. But it's enough. It's enough. You just need to take time to pick up that fork now, and then you just need to file it, right? And when you get on the altar, you just need to file that. 
And there's one thing you've forgotten there is that there's a fork you underestimate and it's called God's grace on your life. And when you have God's grace and then Paul said that the verse said, my grace is sufficient for thee, is sufficient every time flesh, reason, and experience denies it to a T. And then you need to take grace that God has given to you and you, know, you need to go, keep enduring. Trust God, come on. You can do it. I know, the, I know that you're not talented. I know you're not gifted. I know you're not strong. But just... And you realize that you are made to survive. You're not made to die. Now, I think uh, we got some filing to do, shall we? Every head bow and every eye shut.